Yongjia is a is an associated is an associate professor in the Department of Computer Science at UC Davis, and his research interests are in computer vision, machine learning, and computer graphics, uh, with a focus on creating robust visual recognition systems that can learn to understand the real world with minimal human supervision. So let's look forward to uh, Yongjia's presentation. All right, thank you. Kai, let me see if I can show. All right, can you see my screen? Oh uh, yeah. All right, cool. All right, so yeah, thank you so much for having uh, me here today. I'm excited to present our uh, group's work on real-time instance annotation. Okay, so let's let's turn back the clock to 2018. All right, so this is three years ago, um, and we if we think about the um, uh, landscape of object detection back at that time, we had you know, fast uh, two-stage methods like fast RCN, and we had even faster met, uh, methods like YOLO and SSD, which were one stage, right? And these methods were all real time. Um, now, if we look at instance annotation, although we had accurate methods like mask RCNN, which were two-stage two methods, uh, we didn't have any real time instance annotation methods. Uh, and specifically for one stage, we did have methods like FCIS, uh, but we didn't really have a YOLO equivalent right, in instance annotation. And interestingly, uh, Joseph Redman, who's one of the creators of YOLO, had this quote uh, in uh, his YOLO v3 paper in 2018. So I'm going to read it here. So, uh, he says, boxes are stupid anyway. I'm probably a true believer in masks, except I can't get YOLO to learn them. Right? So uh, this kind of, I think, fun example uh, indicates uh, the challenge in creating fast and accurate instance annotation methods. Okay, so why do we care about real-time instance annotation? Well, in many uh, robotics applications like self-driving, uh, you know, drone navigation, or uh, robot grasping, uh, these systems need to interact with objects in the dynamically changing environment in real-time speed right, in order to uh, function properly. Uh, but instance annotation is very challenging uh, because it requires uh, generating for every um, object, a, a class label, a, a box, and an instance uh, mask. Uh, and this needs to be different for instances of the same category, right? So in other words, this task requires different features and label outputs for same class instances in different spatial locations. So this is saying we need translation variants, uh, but, this, but translation variance is hard to obtain in a convolutional network. So the way two-stage uh, instance annotation methods like mask RCNN uh, obtain translation variance in their models is by first uh, generating region proposals in, the st in stage one through a region proposal network, and then using uh, and then cropping those features right that are contained within a particular spatial location of the image, and processing each region separately. Right. So in this way, uh, for each region. Uh, the model can generate a separate category label of um, bounding box coordinates and a uh, foreground uh, background binary sanitation mask. Right? And by isolating each region uh, and processing them independently, the task of instant sanitation becomes much simpler because you're basically just doing um, a foreground background uh, sanitation. Um, so although this uh, uh, framework produces highly accurate results, it's hard to accelerate because it's two stages, which, is, uh, which are sequential, right? So the question is, can we create a one-stage model for real-time instance annotation? And towards this goal, uh, we came up with this uh, uh, a framework called YOLAC. Right? And the key idea here is to break down um, instance annotation into two parallel subtasks. So in one subtask, for each spatial location and scale, uh, in the of the uh, image, right? We're going to generate uh, a class label, box coordinates, and k mass coefficients. And then in the other parallel uh, subtask, we're going to generate image full image sized prototype masks. Okay? And these prototype masks will be computed just once for the image and shared for every single uh, uh, instance. Okay? And then for each uh, instance, we're just going to combine 
uh, in a linear way, the prototypes with the corresponding predicted K mass coefficients. So those mass coefficients will act as weights for each of the prototypes when we're doing a, a linear weighted sum. All right, so let me walk you through the details of the YOLAC architecture. Um, so uh, first we, we have our input image, which goes through a feature backbone and feature pyramid, right? Um, and then on the highest resolution uh, feature layer, so P3 in this case, uh, we attach a fully convolutional network, which we're gonna call a protonet to generate K image resolution prototype mass. Okay? And again, this is going to be just done just once for the, for the image. Uh, then in parallel, uh, in the prediction heads, we're going to predict for each anchor box. So basically each instance, um, we're going to generate a class label, bounding box uh, coordinates, and also K mass coefficients. Uh, and then for, for each instance, we'll linearly combine the prototypes using the corresponding predicted coefficients. Okay. And then finally, we'll crop the resulting uh, soft uh, mask with the predicted bounding box and uh, threshold that soft mask to uh, get a binary uh, segmentation. Okay. So let's look at a exam specific example here where we're um, segmenting uh, this person instance, right? And for this, for this particular um, uh, instance, right? Uh, we're generating the class label, which is person. We have the box uh, coordinates that we've produced. And then we're generating, uh, in addition, these uh, K mass coefficients. So in this toy example, K is equal to four, right? And what these, uh, with these K mass coefficients, all we're gonna do is take these K image size prototypes, right? And we're just going to do a linear weighted sum, right? So uh, in, again, in this toy example, it's plus one, plus one, plus one, minus one. So we're gonna add the first three and subtract the fourth one to get our uh, soft mask, right? And then we'll threshold that to produce the uh, instance annotation mask for this person. Um, and then for a different instance, right? For, so for this anchor box at this location and scale, we've predicted that it's a tennis racket. We've predicted its box parameters. And then we've uh, predicted a uh, four different mass coefficients, right? So this time we're gonna, again, take the same K prototypes that was generated for this image. We'll subtract the first one, add the second, subtract the third, and add the fourth to get this uh, different soft uh, mask segmentation, right? And then we'll uh, uh, threshold that to get the final segmentation mask for this tennis jacket. So um, the reason why this is very fast is, again, we're generating these K prototype masks just once for the entire image, and it's shared for all detections, right? And compared to a standard one stage object detector in the prediction head, we're just at, um, predicting one more K dimensional uh, vector, which is very, very fast. All right, so let's um, analyze um, you know, what these prototypes um, uh, learn, right? Because it's quite interesting. So when we train YOLAC, we, we have three losses, the classification loss, bounding box regression loss, and instance segmentation loss, which is just the binary cross entropy between the uh, ground truth segmentation map for the instance and the predicted instance segmentation mass. And so the prototypes are only being trained by the final mass loss. And uh, we see some interesting emergent behavior. So on the right, what I'm showing on the first row are six uh, images. And on, on the ensuing rows, they're showing different prototype channels. Okay? So for example, the one that has one next to it um, that's the same prototype channel for these six different uh, images. And you can see that some of these prototypes learn to, for example, uh, spatially partition the image. So this prototype one is only firing on the left side of each image, uh, whereas this one is firing towards the bottom, right? Uh, some of them uh, segment the uh, background from the foreground or detect instance contours. And some others encode positional uh, sensitive directional maps. So in particular, this one tends to fire on the lower left uh, part of each object instance. And um, this kind of directional map can be uh, useful for segmenting instances that are uh, of the same class, but uh, spatially you know, close to each other. Because if you know uh, which side 
uh, you know, whether, if you know the you know, left side of an object versus the right side of, the, of, of an object, that can help you distinguish you know, two instances that are very close to each other. And most of the prototypes uh, learn a combination of these properties. Um, so uh, you may have noticed something interesting, which is if you look at this red image, right? And this particular uh, prototype, how is it that a fully convolutional network is producing um, a response that only fires on one side of an image, right? How, where is it getting this positional information? In other words, where's the translation variance coming from, right? Um, so interestingly, um, ResNets are actually uh, inherently translation variant, and that is because of zero padding, okay? So um, as uh, you may already know, we use uh, you know, padding to maintain the input and output spatial resolutions in a, in a given layer, right? Um, but when you add zero, uh, zeros to the boundaries, the model can actually learn uh, filters that understand where the, a pixel is relative to the closest uh, for uh, relative to the four uh, surrounding boundaries that have zeros, right? So it can learn fi filters that propagate, for example, those zeros. Um, and in, in uh, ResNet 50, we see zero padding mm -hmm. uh, 17 different times. So there's um, lots of layers that actually have zero padding that the model can uh, uh, use to encode positional information. And in a paper that came out a few months after um, uh, after YOLAC, um, there was this, um, you know, this paper from iClear 2020 also um, dived deeper into, uh, into these details. So I would encourage you to check out that paper for more deeper analysis if you're interested. Um, and uh, in a follow-up PAMI uh, journal extension of our ICCD uh, work, uh, we made several improvements to the basic uh, YOLAG framework. I won't go into details here, except to mention that we have a, a fast way to rescore the mass so that the final scores for each instance demutation mass is better correlated with the uh, predicted mass quality. Okay, so um, let's look at some results. So what I'm showing you here in this plot is a speed performance trade-off, right? So the x-axis is uh, FPS, so inference speed, right? And the y-axis is uh, mask MAP on MS Coco. Um, this chart is about uh, uh, a year old. So, um, you know, since then there have been um, uh, more accurate methods, but you can, you notice that YOLAG uh, is, um, you know, getting real-time speeds and some of its variants like these ones are able to get uh, competitive uh, performance to the state of the art. Uh, here are some qualitative results. So um, on a you know, variety of diverse scenes, uh, YOLAC is able to generate uh, high quality instance imitation mass. And you can see that, you know, for example, if you look at this uh, example image on the right here with the two soccer players, it's clearly performing instance imitation because these two people that are uh, you know, next to each other, our, our method is able to produce different instance labels for them. Um, and, uh, you know, one stage instance annotation is a really active uh, area of research. So over the several uh, past several months, there's been uh, you know, lots of uh, papers. Um, so again, I would like to encourage you to uh, check out these works if you're interested in this. Uh, I do want to mention um, that, you know, a lot of these methods do build upon this uh, YOLAC, you know, design of generating image size prototype mass and then uh, combining in them in some way because that's really critical for getting fast uh, speeds and instance annotation. Okay, so um, having said that, while YOLAC is very, very fast, it's not quite fast enough for real-time inference on edge devices. Um, and specifically on a Jetson Xavier, it's only able to get, get uh, six frames per second. Um, and so if we want to create robots that can, um, you know, use a method like YOLAC, we really want uh, YOLAC to be able to run on these, you know, small edge devices, right, instead of bulky servers, servers or workstations. Um, so the key idea that we had in our ICRA uh, uh, paper this year um, called YOLAC Edge uh, is to exploit temporal redundancy in video. And so if you look at this uh, example here, this is showing a sequence of uh, six frames from a, a, a YouTube video over like a two second time period. And you can see that most of the content remains the same, right? Um, the, the snow remains the same, the trees are essentially the same. Um, 
So this means that we, we don't actually have to recompute features on every single frame. We could instead compute features on a sparse set of keyframes and then um, reuse those features on non-keyframes, for example, by warping those features to the adjacent, temporally adjacent frames. Uh, however, if we also zoom into the snow border, we can actually see that the appearance of the snow border changes quite a bit, right? So um, in these kind of cases, if we were to warp the features from adjacent frames, there might be a lot of uh, error that's introduced. So this suggests that we should have both warp features and uh, computer features in each frame. Um, and at a high level, this is um, inspired by uh, uh, some related work on video object detection, uh, but our focus here is on instance segmentation, and in particular, getting real-time inference speeds on edge devices. So it's very important that our uh, flow modules and warping modules are uh, simple and, uh, uh, and very, very fast to run on edge devices. All right, so let's look at the computational um, you know, breakdown of, of YOLAG. So in this uh, table on the right, what I'm showing is, um, yeah, or you can see that the backbone in YOLAC occupies about 55% of the co total computation, right? And then in the left uh, table, you can see that within a ResNet 101 backbone, the C4 stage occupies about 66% of, uh, of the total computation. Um, so our key idea is to only compute the C4 stage features on keyframes, warp them to non-keyframes, and then for all frames, we'll still compute uh, the C1 to C3 stage features because they're quite efficient to compute. So here's our YOLAC edge architecture. Then for every keyframe, we'll do exactly the same thing that we did in YOLAC. Okay? And um, in practice, we'll sample every fifth frame to be the uh, keyframe. <laughs> in okay? um, and then for the uh, non-keyframes, which are about 80% of, uh, of a video, we'll only compute these blue, uh, blue blocks. Okay? So in the backbone, we'll only compute up to C3. We'll skip the computation for C4 and C5. And instead, we'll warp the P4 and P5 features from the previous closest uh, keyframe. Okay? So that's what, uh, what is indicated here with W4 and W5. Right? Um, and then using these warp features um, we'll, and, and combining them with the uh, uh, computed C3 features will generate P3. Which will create the uh, prototype mass, right? And then the prediction hex will uh, work with these warp features to generate the class uh, bounding box coordinates and mass coefficients. So um, I want to highlight here that uh, because we are we're, we're doing a partial feature transform, meaning we're for this non-keyframe we're still computing up to C3, and C3 is what's used to generate P3 in addition to the uh, warped. W4 here, right? And that's very important because the prototype mass are what's going to ultimately be uh, combined to generate the final segmentation mass. So we really need uh, accurate prototype mass. And with our design where we're computing up to C3, this, in it, this is enabled. Right? And, um, and in terms of speed, as long as our uh, process for warping the P4 and P5 features from the previous keyframe to the current non-keyframe, Right? As long as that warping operation is faster than generating C4 and C5, we're going to get a speed up. Um, and so we've uh, developed a uh, efficient flow warping module for, for this purpose. And you can check out our paper for more details. OK, so let's look at some uh, results. This is showing um, performance on uh, uh, NVIDIA uh, Jetson Xavier AGX, right? this uh, red highlighted column here. And you can see from. Um, we're able to get about a 1.6 times speed up uh, over YOLAC by, uh, uh, through our uh, uh, YOLAC edge uh, framework, which exploits temporal redundancy. Right? And it only uh, introduces a minor degradation in uh, accuracy. Now, with further uh, tensor RT optimization, we're, uh, for the first time, able to get uh, more than 30 uh, FPS speeds on a Jetson uh, Xavier. OK, so here I wanted to show you a live or, or recorded live webcam uh, demo of the Alive Edge. OK, so this is uh, running. We've attached a webcam to our Jetson, right? And uh, the Yolak Edge is running on the Jetson. Right? 
Uh, and you can see again in these, um, you know, it's able to uh, segment with a pretty high accuracy, uh, right, a diverse set of uh, different objects. Okay, so uh, to conclude, uh, YOLACT and its variants are the uh, first competitive uh, real-time instance segmentation algorithms uh, that we developed in our lab. Uh, there are still, um, you know, several limitations, including, you know, dealing with small objects and crowded scenes. Um, and for future work, I'm personally very interested in not only getting real-time inference, right, speeds, but also being able to learn uh, and update these models on device in, in real time. Um, so, um, you know, I, um, I'm also looking forward to more um, research along that line from our community. And um, our code and models are publicly available on these GitHub pages and YOLACT is also a part of OpenMM Lab. And finally, I'd like to thank all my uh, former and current uh, uh, students who worked and led uh, these various projects. Okay, thank you. And with that, I'd be happy to take any questions. Mm, can you hear me now? Uh, yeah, yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. I, I mean, question is, I used your app to detect the traffic video. And I found that your app has a better uh, prevention detection than my app. Your app would do better uh, prevention detection than your app. Better uh, prevention detection? Sorry, better. Yeah. Localization, localization. Okay. I think okay. I think masks are uh, usually you know, in the mask. Of course, it will improve the localization. I think. Um, but uh, my question is, since the that a center mask, the center mask is anchor free. Do you have any data of the comparison between the uh, your work and the com center uh, center mask? Yes, anchor free part. Under free method plus mask. Um, yeah. the localization, uh, localization accuracy. So, yeah. um, this is the first question. The second question is the uh, the the yo the yolo at edge, right? You, you want to improve the speed. The yolo at edge. Can you can you hear me more clearly now? Oh, it's okay. Oh, yeah. okay. Yeah, I just it. I just oh and the Yolo Act Yolo Act Edge, you want to improve the speed, right? And I want so you you ski, uh, you use the feature of the key frames. And the, uh, so and then we don't uh, extract the feature from non-key frames, right? That will reduce car uh, computation uh, computation co uh, cost. But uh, my question is do you, because the video, you know, video is not the static images. There are uh, some uh, pollution and the blurring. I wonder what's, you know, what's, uh, how is, uh, you kind of uh, deal with the, when the video is blurring or the records or something, objects are, you know, occluded, occluded, you know, sorry, I think, yeah, two questions. Okay, okay. Oh, yeah, yeah, I think I... There's some, there's some echo. Uh, okay, so to answer, yeah, thank you. So to answer your second question about, um, you know, the challenges in video, I think you were saying like there's motion blur. Yeah, you're absolutely right. So um, what, there's, I think overall, I would say because of the motion blurs, you know, the, the features that are generated can be more like uh, corrupted or have artifacts compared to static images. So that is definitely a challenge in uh, um, you know, video processing in general. Uh, it's further you know, complicated in our setting by the fact that because we are um, warping these features, right? When there's, when from keyframe to a non-keyframe, if either the keyframe or non-keyframe or both are uh, blurry, right? Um, the, the flow that's computed, flow that is computed will also be uh, more inaccurate. Um, so that is definitely a challenge. Uh, in terms of, I think you were mentioning like anchor-free based object detection methods um, that are uh, used uh, for instance segmentation like center mass. Yeah. So uh, what we noticed in our YOLACT uh, work was a, a lot of the errors are coming from the, um, from the, um, from the object detection uh, itself. 
Okay, the detector itself. So if we can actually improve the detector, we can actually um, get better instant sanitation uh, results. And I think that's what some of these uh, papers that came out in the past year, like Center Mass, have shown that if you use a better detector like FCOS, so we used um, a, a variant of RetinaNet, um, but they were able to get a better performance. Okay, yeah, thank you. Okay, I think is that, I think that uh, might be it. So, it's so it's maybe it's in the interest of time, we can- um, Yeah, thank you, there's a question in the chat. Thank you. Oh, there's a question in the chat. Okay, is the optical flow used to used to parcel transform the features estimated in real time on the edge devices? Yes, they are. So everything is real time. Like everything is computed on device. Okay. All right. Thank you, everyone. I will pass it back to Kai. Okay. Uh, thank you, Young Jack. Uh, very good presentations. And then uh, we are get to have uh, Anna Yuli to uh, to share his experience and recent work.